Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to talk. As a uh, toxicologist that works in a soil science department, this is really up my alley. Um, so I'm going to talk about mobility and bioavailability of manufactured nanomaterials in agricultural soils. Um, as was mentioned before, really nanomaterials like organic chemicals um, are, have been incorporated into all sorts of different products. You know, everything from mobile phones to personal care products, um, you know, paints, textiles, just about everything, facades of buildings. Um, so in recent years, they've really become sort of pervasive. And we've done quite a bit of research on the mobility and fate of nanomaterials that enter wastewater treatment plants uh, and ultimately partitioned to biosolids. So we just completed a five-year project that was funded by the EPA and the National Environmental Research Council of the UK where we built pilot wastewater treatment plants, introduced nanomaterials, produced biosolids, amended soils, and sort of tracked the fate. Um, so we, we, we know a little bit about that, much less than you know, ordinary metals um, or <clears throat> organic contaminants, but there's some, some basis. Um, what I really want to focus on today is the use of nanofertilizers and nanopesticides, which is more of a, an emerging topic. Um, and it's expanding rapidly, but really there's been very little work done uh, determining the fate and transport of these materials and bioavailability. So there's a few things that we really need to get a handle on. And one is the persistence of nanocarriers, and I'll explain what I mean by this in a minute. Uh, and nano AI, so active ingredients themselves can be nanomaterials in soil, um, leaching and runoff potential, so entering surface and groundwater, and then uptake into crops. And I think a point that was mentioned before, just on a mass flow basis, um, staple crops, so grain crops and forage crops are particularly important in terms of determining exposure, although many studies focus on fruits and vegetables. Um, but you know, those make up a relatively small proportion of the mass of the diet. Um, is, it, is it the green button? Green. Yeah, that makes sense. So here's my, as a person who does a lot of imaging, so my main tools are x-ray microscopes and um, electron microscopes. Having, a you know, four slides with a bunch of bullets was um, not really the way that I wanted to go. But um, so on the left, on your, uh, on my left, your right, so there, I have just an image discussing um, nanomaterials that are used as pesticides. So in the top row, this is really where you take an ordinary active ingredient and make either a microemulsion that has nanoscale components or a nanoscale emulsion. Um, a lot of these concepts actually come from drug delivery. So we're now taking things, nanoscale objects that were developed for use in drug delivery and adapting them for use of uh, delivery of pesticides and um, fertilizers. Um, you can also have just nanoscale dispersion of colloidal particles of an active ingredient. Um, and so because we're dealing with, you know, changing the sort of the formulation in a more fundamental way than just adding like a surfactant or something like that, this can really change the way that fertilizers and pesticides move in the environment. Um, so one thing that I should mention here is that there's really an opportunity here to reduce the use of pesticides and fertilizers using nanoscale carriers. Um, so the vast majority of agrochemicals don't actually make it to the target. They either leach into groundwater or leave through runoff or through volatilization. They can be degraded um, through photodegradation. So you know, within these nano emulsions, you can incorporate something like a sunscreen uh, to, to decrease the breakdown of the compounds. Um, so in the second row, there are polymer-based um, targeting par particles, lipid-based, you know, hollow spheres, something like uh, porous uh, silica. And so these can actually become composite materials where you not only have a carrier, but you can attach a targeting molecule. So one of the applications that we work on uh, in my group, in collaboration with entomologists, is targeting uh, delivery of double-stranded RNA as a highly targeted pesticide, um, layer double hydroxides, these sorts of things. And now we're not really just dealing with the, you know, physicochemical properties of the compound itself, but the surface chemistry of the particles. Um, so on the left, 
just a few images from sort of some classic research that we did a number of years ago, which is really showing that these nanoscale materials can enter food chains. Um, so in this system, we use tobacco and tobacco hornworm, and we use gold nanoparticles as a tracer uh, because they don't, there's no background of gold, um, and the particles are relatively insoluble, so that we know that when we find gold, we know through X-ray absorption spectroscopy and other means that it's an intact particle. So in the top image, this is an X-ray fluorescence micrograph, uh, where the green is, is showing potassium, just to give you an idea of the structure of a leaf. And then you can see in the red is gold, so nanoparticles are actually able to, through endocytosis, make it into the xylem of plants and be translocated into leaves. And then there's a, you can see there's a little tobacco hornworm feeding on the plant. And then the image of the right is a cross-section through the mid-gut area of the hornworm, showing that the gold is completely through the cross-section of the tissue of the insect. And then the bottom, what you see is really just accumulated concentrations as a mass concentration or particle number as a function of particle size. But we found that in certain instances with certain physiologies of organisms, particles can actually biomagnify. So they accumulate um, greater uh, quantities of the material in their tissues than the foods that they're feeding on. Um, and part of this stems from the fact that for insoluble particles, they have no means of elimination. So if they're larger than about five to seven nanometers, they can't really uh, be eliminated. And so in the example of humans, like through the glomerulus, there's no way that a particle can pass through that, that boundary. Um, so what we really need um, in terms of these nano agrochemicals uh, is really to focus on the surface chemistry. It's not the core chemistry of the particle that's important, it's what's on the surface. One of the things that makes these materials unique is that the surfaces can be decorated with different targeting molecules and things like that. Um, so how, how do those changes affect their persistence in soil, particularly with things like polymer nanoparticles or metal nanoparticles? Uh, partitioning between soil surfaces and pore water, so how does that surface interact with soil surfaces? Uh, mechanisms and extent of uptake into forage and grain crops. And then sort of along the lines of uh, Nick's research, oral bioavailabilities from crops to humans and animals. Um, we've worked a lot with invertebrates, insects, that sort of thing in our, our lab because it's more of a ecological focus, um, but some of those methods might be useful. Uh, as was mentioned before, we really have analytical challenges. We've actually done really well with the inorganic nanoparticles at developing methods of detecting them even at part per quadrillion levels using single particle mass spectrometry. Uh, but when it comes to the soft nanomaterials that are made out of polymers, we really have significant challenges detecting those. And that's probably mainly what will be used um, in agrochemical formulations. Uh, finally, there's an we need an inventory. Uh, there's really no way to know which products have nanomaterials in them now until you put them under an electron microscope. So, you know, this will feed into risk assessment, but also rational design of safer uh, materials that can actually decrease environmental impacts relative to conventional active ingredients. Um, you really need deep integration of a variety of different disciplines. So not, in order to really work effectively with people from other disciplines, you can't just say, oh, I'm gonna go work with this person. You have to learn about their discipline so that you can speak their language. So I've had the privilege of being part of a research center where we now have, you know, materials engineers growing plants, and you know, I'm a toxicologist doing materials engineering, and you really have to kind of dive into those disciplines to work together. Um, there's been some funding, but it's really on the decline in the United States right now, whereas in the EU with the Horizon 2020 uh, framework, they're really ramping up their research in this area. And scientists in the EU want to work together with us, but we kind of can't do it now because the funding is sort of in decline. Um, and just my last point is that, you know, in talking with my industry colleagues, the, not having an environmental health and safety framework for these materials really uh, hampers innovation and makes them very um, hesitant to go into developing materials which could actually be more sustainable than what we're using now. So thanks a lot.